And I'm gonna introduce myself to our recording students. Thank you so much for joining us. We're on session number 25, Jesus, the Son of God, in the series called The Story. I'm Paul McLeod, the Minister of Education here at uh, Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Now for everyone, both our live students this evening and those watching the recording, we're gonna do a, a couple of things. The first emphasis I would like for us to look at is understanding that Jesus's growing power and influence help us uh, to see his true identity more clearly. Understand that Jesus's growing power and influence help us see his identity more clearly. The second thing, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you picked up in the reading, as I was reading through it, uh, uh, one thing that jumped out at me is this Son of Man. I, I do notice the title of our chapter is Son of God, Jesus, the Son of God. But several times, Jesus is either referred to or he refers to himself as the Son of Man. And we're going to take a uh, take a look at that and see if that and it should add a, an extra dimension or some additional understanding into Jesus's identity. Now, as far as Jesus's growing power and influence, uh, helping us to see his true identity, we need to realize that in this stage of Jesus's uh, ministry, this is the later stage of his ministry, uh, that he is growing in power and influence. I mean, the crowds are getting a little larger. People are talking about him more. He's heading towards Jerusalem. And in our reading, he got into Jerusalem. But as his popularity was growing, so was the hatred of the Jewish leaders toward him. And so we see this dynamic of his, both his popularity and his, the hatred towards him is growing and is adding tension to the story. And we're, somehow that tension is going to be released, it's gonna be resolved, and we'll have to see how that is. Now, there were some who believed Jesus. They heard his teachings, he, they took him at his word, they believed. They may not have totally understood, and we saw that from the disciples. Uh, Jesus came out and said, hey, look, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be put into the hands of the, of the leaders, and I'm going to die, uh, but I'm going to be raised up. There's going to be a resurrection. And many believed, may not have totally understood, but they did believe. As I mentioned a minute ago, some, they were on the opposite end of the spectrum, and they totally hated him. In fact, in your reading, you can see that some were plotting to kill him, just waiting for an opportunity. And then there's this third group of people where there was a lot of speculation. Some said that he was, quote, the prophet. Some had said that Elisha had come back. Uh, even some had thought that maybe John the Baptist has come back uh, from the dead. And so there was this group of people that, that had all these guesses and all this speculation about who, uh, who is this, uh, this Jesus. The key question that comes down to us, however, is what do you do with Jesus? Uh, imagine yourself being Peter and Jesus asking you, uh, you know, what do people say who I am? And you get all these answers. And then uh, Peter, hey, you know, who do you say I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And so we have to really turn that around and ask ourselves. Today, this evening is a good opportunity to ask yourself, what do you do with Jesus? Where do you stand in that? Well, to help us and to, and to give us some more background about this, we're going to watch the video. Uh, Randy Frazee is going to point out a, a couple of great things about it. You can take notes. Uh, if, you take, if you take your study guide and turn to page 213, you'll see a fill-in-the-blank uh, uh, bullet points there at the bottom of the page, page 213, and that those can be some notes that you take away from this, this session. So we're going to take a look at the video. I'm going to make some summary statements, and then we're going to share uh, some of your takeaways 
uh, from, uh, from this week. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. You may need to turn your volume up or down depending on your device. So here we go. This is your story. This is my story. But most of all, it's the greatest story ever told. This is God's story. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do the people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. When I was a boy, there was a popular show on television, yes, in black and white, called What's My Line? Contestants with unusual occupations were interviewed by the panelists. Only questions that could be answered with a yes or no were allowed. At the conclusion of the questioning, the panelists attempted to guess the contestant's occupation. Now, there were also mystery guests, usually a famous person like Alfred Hitchcock or Groucho Marx. The panelists had to wear masks, and the guest usually disguised his or her voice. This chapter of the story could be entitled, What's My Line? Jesus is the guest with the unusual occupation. The panelists are the disciples, the religious leaders, and the people from Galilee to Jerusalem. You see, it's one thing to be mesmerized by all the teachings of Jesus, but his primary occupation is not a teacher. It's one thing to be captured by all the healings he performed, but his primary occupation is not a physician. You can even be inspired on how he lived his life and loved people, but his primary occupation is not all-time good guy. All of these things added to the evidence of his true occupation. So what's Jesus' line? We begin with the disciples. Jesus says to them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Now Peter answered correctly, but he wasn't dialed in on the exact job description for the Messiah. So Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now, Peter didn't like the idea, and he decides to rebuke Jesus. And Jesus responds, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. 
He told Peter he was thinking completely from the lower story and missing the upper story plan. Next, Jesus goes to Jerusalem. The religious leaders and the common citizens are now the panelists. Jesus goes during a popular holiday for the Jewish people called the Feast of Tabernacles, which meant the city was packed with people. The people began to guess Jesus' occupation. Some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he deceives people. About halfway through the festival, Jesus gets up and starts to teach. They ask the question, how did this man get such learnings without having been taught? Good question that demands an answer. After hearing his teaching, some of the panelists guessed, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he's the Messiah. Still others ask, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Ding, this person was right. Check the facts. Jesus is from the lineage of David and he was born in Bethlehem. Jesus then started dropping clues. He said, I am the light of the world. Only God himself is the source of light. Huh. Later he said, I am from above, you are of this world. We might say, I am from the upper story, you're from the lower story. Only God claims residence in heaven. Someone asked sarcastically, are you greater than our father Abraham? Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. This was the day Abraham dreamed of when God said that from his nation, all people would be blessed. Jesus is that blessing. Then Jesus laid down the whopper. Very truly I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus is not only saying that he was around before Abraham, but he claimed himself as the I am. Remember back in the Old Testament when Moses was going to Egypt to let the people go? Moses asked God, who should I say sent me? God said, tell them I am sent you. This is the name for God, Yahweh, Jehovah. People were ready to stone Jesus. Now fast forward to the Passover feast. This is the granddaddy of all Jewish feasts. This celebration commemorated the day that the angel of the Lord passed over the homes of the Hebrew families with boys because the blood of the lamb was washed over the doorpost of their homes. Jesus shows up in Jerusalem right before this feast begins. Surely the panelists are getting warmer. Before he enters Jerusalem, he sends his disciples into the town to fetch a donkey. Now, they don't know why, but they do it. Jesus gets on the donkey and rides into Jerusalem. Now, what's he trying to say? What's the clue that he's giving? The prophet Zechariah of the Old Testament told us that the Messiah would come and do just this. Listen to his words. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The people must have understood this because they began to lay palm branches in front of him to make a path into Jerusalem. Some were simply waving their branches. And as they did, they shouted, just like Zechariah suggested they should. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. This song was overtly suggesting that he is the Messiah. Remember that the Hebrew phrase Messiah was used of the kings of Israel and meant anointed one. Jesus' occupation was to sit on the throne of David. Hosanna in Hebrew means to save. Still people in the crowd ask, who is this? The answer of many, oh, he is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Many of the people got his title, the Messiah. Many people were still clueless, but none guessed his true occupation. None knew what this Messiah was called to do. 
they most likely thought that the Messiah would come to become their king and restore them to political greatness over Rome, a mere lower story accomplishment. But God had a grander plan for Jesus, a higher upper story assignment. The one group he spoke plainly to was his disciples. He told them, they will condemn me to death and will hand me over to the Gentiles who will mock me and spit on me and kill me. Three days later, I will rise. He told them plainly, but I don't think it truly sank into their soul. What is Jesus' line? You are now the panelist. What do you think? We now know God's full plan. He sent his son who sat by his side in the upper story to come down to the lower story to represent us. Everything in the life and the stories of Israel pointed to his coming. God's plan is for him to die. He is going to pay for our sins so we can be made right with God and come back into a personal relationship with him like Adam and Eve had before the fall. He is the lamb without blemish that died a million times in all of those sacrifices in Israel. He is God. He is the Lamb of God offered up for our sins. That's Jesus' line, and it's all going to come down in the next chapter. And so what we see, what we see here is that Jesus is the Son of God. The Messiah, the one who was prophesied to come, the clues are there. And so Jesus' line is that he is the Son of God, the Messiah sent to suffer and die. And next, uh, next week we'll talk about and, and think about this thing called atonement and, um, and the suffering for us and the substitutionary atonement. We'll talk about that for our sins. But right now, the clues are there that he is the Messiah sent to suffer and that he will be resurrected. And we'll start putting really the big pieces together next week. Let's reflect on your learning this past week. If you turn to your study guide on page 215, on page 215, you'll see a question there. I believe it's at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the page. And it basically says, yes, page 215, number four at the top of the page. And it says, as you reflect on what you learned this week in chapter 25, what is your biggest takeaway? Several big things uh, probably in this chapter, but what was the biggest takeaway for you uh, in this chapter? Take a minute, take a pen or a pencil. Uh, there's some lines provided there. And write a sentence or two that would boil down what the biggest takeaway that you've had this week. So I'll give you uh, three or four minutes to go ahead and pin that, and then we'll, uh, we'll share with each other uh, some of our learnings. Right, if you look at your screen, I've asked you to uh, unmute so you can go ahead and unmute yourself and chime in. Uh, and we'll have a handful of people share what they have written down. Who, who wants to go first? Okay, in the big book on page 365 at the bottom of the page, it reads, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Yet, at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. Okay. <laughs> What's your big <laughs> takeaway on that? Well, it was, you know, it was amazing that he had done so many things. He had showed his majesty and his uh, ability to heal and to, to perform miracles. And uh, a lot of, of them that believed in him would not openly say so. 
you know, they were kind of, uh, I, I say wishy-washy, they were more concerned about what uh, others would think of them if they acknowledged that he was the Messiah. Uh, that goes on even today. Hmm. Okay. How now, as you pull, you know, that's what happened then, as you pull that into and apply it to today, it does look like there's some overlap. And we're, we're talking about the response. When we talk about today, of course, we're talking about the response of the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. Uh, so what is that? Uh, let me ask you, Mary, uh, to today's application and context, how do you see that being similar? Well, there are those who proclaim to be Christians uh, and lovers of, of Christ and his teachings, but the way they live their lives and how they treat their fellow man does not uh, exemplify that. Uh, that goes on a lot. We know that goes on a lot. Um, and it went on then, and it still is going on now. So we see in the scripture that there are some common responses to truth. Uh, and, and during Jesus' time, the truth of his identity, the truth of the Messiah coming, uh, and, it, and even when John the Baptist was there, and he was, he was saying, repent uh, and believe. And Jesus said the same thing, repent and believe and be baptized. We see similar responses today. Okay. We see some belief. We see some unbelief. We see some uh, saying, Lord, Lord, but they're not actually not saved. And even in the scripture, it says everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is not, a, is not a necessarily a believer. What comes to mind as you were describing that, Mary, is the parable of the four soils. When, when, I, think about, when I think about the gospel going out, the truth going out, and all the different responses that can happen, I think about the, the four soils. There's nothing wrong with the seed. The word goes out. The gospel is pro preached. It is taught. Uh, but it's the hearts. It's, it's the people's response to that gospel that is varied. And that's, uh, that's good that you saw that similarity. Okay. That's great. So I'd like to piggyback on that a little bit. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, good. Um, so my girlfriend and I had a discussion about this last week, and I was saying um, the verse that says, no one comes through the other religions who may not necessarily believe that. She said, but she believes that God is so big and he's, he's much bigger than we can ever understand that he's opened a way for them to be saved that we'll never know about. Hmm. You cut out for just a second um, and froze for just a second. Can you uh, uh, say that again uh, for me? I'm sorry. Oh, just the last part? Um, it was kind of the middle part. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, ahead. okay. So I quoted what you heard that part. I quoted what no one comes to the Father except through me. And she said there are other religions that may not necessarily believe that, but she believes that God is so big and he's bigger than we can ever understand that she believes that he has set a way for those people to be saved that we'll never understand. Okay. Is she saying or is she implying that there are other ways to the Father, uh, to God, uh, outside of Jesus? Is that what she was? She's implied? saying that she's saying that those she's saying that those other religions may think that, and we shouldn't judge it because God is so much bigger than we can understand that He has prepared a way for them to be saved. Okay, so let me make sure I'm being clear before I have a response. So is, <laughs> she, <laughs> is she saying that the other religions believe that? Their way is a way of salvation to the Father, and the reason yes. being is that God is bigger than we are. 
Yes. That's what she's basically saying. Yeah. Yes. Well, what did she? Um, that's that's not, not that she believes that she believes what I believe. She's just saying that these other religions, uh, because I was strong, I was so strong in saying that the only way you can get to him is through Jesus Christ. And she was saying, well, you can't condemn the other religions because God is so much bigger that he has prepared a way maybe for them to get there another way that we can't understand. So is that her opinion? I, dis I disagree oh. with that. I disagree with that, but that's what she was saying. We were okay. going that, back and forth. Okay. Was that her opinion or was she uh, mouthing someone else's opinion? I'm it was, I think it was a pastor's uh, opinion. Okay. For us not to judge, for us not to judge the other religions, while they may not believe that, that we shouldn't judge them because we don't know what God has prepared for them to get to heaven also. Okay. Well, a couple things going, a couple things going on there. I just wanted to make sure I was clear whether that was her opinion or not, because if it was her opinion, my next question will be, how did she come to that conclusion? Uh, that's that's right. always my question when someone um, uh, states something like that. Um, I, I think the scripture is clear that uh, Jesus is the only way uh, to the Father. I, I think that's in the, in the plain sense of scriptural teaching. Uh, I, I believe that is the, the truth. The fact that God is bigger than we are really doesn't play on that. Uh, yes, God is bigger than we are. He knows everything. He sees everything. He's all powerful. He's all good. But that really does not negate uh the the uh, the truth that Jesus is the only way to Him, uh, and the fact that we may be ignorant of of quote other ways does not negate the truth that Jesus is the only way. Um, that really that really doesn't fit together. That that really doesn't uh, fit together. Um, and and the other piece of the puzzle, I heard you say something about uh, about judging. Um, we're not judging. There's some, there's some who would say, oh, you Christians, you judge other people that they're going to hell and you really can't judge others uh, because in Matthew, and they'll even quote it, uh, I think it's Matthew 6, judge not lest ye be judged. Well, uh, God actually does ask us to judge. Um, we have the, um, in that scripture, if you look at it in context, he's basically saying, don't judge hypocritically. Uh, look at the, the plank in your own eye before making a judgment uh, of other people. And then down in the scripture, he even tells us how to judge. And, uh, and, then, he, <laughs> and then he talks about, uh, don't cast your pearls before swine. That sounds like a judgment on the swine. Uh, so in effect, mm -hmm. <laughs> in effect, we shouldn't be judgmental. However, I, I believe if the scripture is clear in saying that Jesus is the only way uh, to the Father. Does that kind of make sense? Or I guess you were, I, you didn't yeah, say. I, and I it. believe that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you I was trying to debate. We finally just it. gave up. Yeah, we finally yeah. just gave up on the debate, but I believe that. And I was real strong. And she was saying, even though she believes this too, she was just saying other religions because God's so big. And we kind of just dropped it at that because Agreed. I don't believe Agreed. what she said. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let me offer this suggestion. Uh, anytime I get into a discussion, and I, and I love discussing these, uh, these things, um, uh, two questions I always ask, the first two questions are, what do you mean? I always try to get an understanding, uh, put some meat on on what they're what they're saying, you know, and say it back to them. Oh, are you saying that because God is bigger than we are and we're ignorant of his all of his ways, that Jesus is not the only way to the Father? Is that what you're saying? And once I understand what they're saying, my second question is is uh, usually, well, how did you come to that conclusion? You know, what is there a scripture? Is this uh, someone else's opinion? Is this a book that you read? And then, and then have a discussion on that level uh, because if, if, you, if it's not on that level, you're just butting heads. In my opinion, your opinion, 
uh, and we're spinning our wheels. Right. That kind of makes sense? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that, uh, uh, that discussion. All right. Who else has a, has a takeaway? Uh, Paul, I, one of uh, my takeaways that I got from this lesson is that when we start to give uh, give people a scorecard or tell God I, uh, what all we have done and what we have given up and what we have did this and we have did that and uh, he comes in I'm on 362 and when he tells us that no one has left families or friends or occupations or did anything unless it's for the gospel that he will not repay a hundred foes. And then he says, um, especially those who suffer along with persecution, he said that we will come to the age of eternal life, but those who are first will be last and those who are last will be first. So we have nothing to brag about. Okay, that's pretty good. Because uh, cause it's God who does the work, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all for uh, sharing that. Uh, I appreciate the discussion and the, uh, uh, the glimpse at your, your takeaways. Um, and do that once in a while, if you don't mind, during your reading sit back and think about, okay, what's the biggest takeaway that I have so far? And maybe even take some notes, answer some of the questions in the, in the study guide. The more you interact with the scripture, and the more you reflect, and the more you write in the study book, uh, in the study guide, uh, the more you'll get out of the story, the more you'll get out of this series. So let me encourage you to do that. Changing gears uh, slightly, we take a look at the, the second thing that I said earlier as far as understanding that Jesus' true identity includes being the son of man. I'm hoping that I'm not just the only one who was reading this past week and noticed this, uh, this son of man and was wondering, okay, uh, son of God, okay, I've got that. I've heard that before. That's being explained. Um uh, but the son of man thing that was mentioned several times in the reading, what in the world is that? Well, Jesus referred to, or he refers to himself as the son of man many times in, in the gospel. Uh, you know, we often think of Jesus as the son of God, but why is Jesus also the son of man? Well, to help us in that, I'm going to show you a short video. It's about maybe five or six minutes. It's from the Bible Project entitled Son of Man. So let me share my screen. You can adjust your sound, and we'll take a look and see uh, what Son of Man uh, means as far as Jesus is concerned. If you read the New Testament, you'll notice that the most common title people use to describe Jesus is the Christ, that is, the Messiah. But surprisingly, Jesus almost never used that word to describe himself. Instead, he called himself the Son of Man. The Son of Man. What does that mean? Well, the phrase comes from an important chapter in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel was an Israelite prisoner of war who was forced to live in the empire of Babylon and work for the prideful, violent king who destroyed his home. That sounds horrible. And while he was living and working in Babylon, Daniel had this crazy prophetic dream. You ready for it? I'm ready. He saw four beasts crawling out of a dark sea, hybrid monster-like animals, each scarier than the one before. And the fourth beast is so mutant, there's nothing to compare it to. And it's violent, leaving death and destruction in its wake. What in the world is this about? Well, he's told that these beasts symbolize violent, prideful kings and their empires. Oh, like the one Daniel's enslaved to. Yeah, and these creatures might seem random to you, but these images are developing an important biblical theme. How humans are these remarkable creatures capable of doing great good and horrible evil. How we can behave like animals. 
Right. Look at the first pages of the Bible. God creates the beasts of the field and humans together, all from the dust. But then the humans are set apart and given a royal task of being God's image. So humans are like the animals, but called to become much more. Yeah, they're to be God's representatives on earth, ruling on his behalf, like kings and queens. But keep reading, and the humans are deceived by a beast who says that they could be more than just God's partners. Yeah, that they could rule the world on their own terms, which sounds good to them. But God knows this will be a disaster. And so he expels the humans to the realm of the beasts. The partnership is lost. But God makes a promise that one day a human will be born who won't give in to the beast. Rather, he'll overcome and strike the beast while being struck by it. Okay, so for the rest of the biblical story, we're waiting for that human. But instead, in story after story, we find people acting like beasts. Yeah, like in the next story about Cain. He was jealous and angry at his brother Abel. God warns Cain that he's facing a beastly urge called sin, a dark, mysterious kind of evil that consumes humans. But God says that Cain can rule the beast if he chooses. But he doesn't rule the beast. He lets this urge devour him and he becomes a beast. And then after this, Cain's children spread their animal-like violence, and it leads to the founding of a whole civilization known for its beastly pride, the city of Babylon. Okay, Babylon. So fast forward, this is where Daniel is enslaved, having this bizarro dream. Exactly. Now, watch what happens next in Daniel's dream. He sees into God's throne room where a court is set up, and God condemns the beast to destruction. That's great. And then Daniel sees that there's actually more than one divine throne. Oh, right, the throne that humanity left behind. Right. There hasn't been a human who's able to overcome the beast and rule alongside God until now. Daniel sees a figure called the Son of Man, which means a human. And he rides on a cloud up into God's presence and then sits down on the divine throne to rule the world. The partnership's renewed. Yes, and even more, all humanity worships and serves this Son of Man alongside God. Oh, worship? So this is no ordinary human. This is like a God human. Exactly. And so now you can see why Jesus of Nazareth, when he came onto the scene centuries later, chose this title, the Son of Man, for himself. He was claiming to be that truly human one on a mission to confront the beast. He was tempted to seize power on the beast's terms. But unlike every human before him, Jesus resisted the urge. And then he went about banishing the beast from people's lives, and he was teaching people how to rule the beast instead of being ruled by it. Okay, so how do you rule the beast? Well, Jesus did it by giving up his life. Wait, rule the beast by dying? Yes. When Jesus was on trial in a human courtroom and being condemned to death, he said, From this moment on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at God's right hand and coming on the clouds. But this is the moment he's about to die. Exactly. From one perspective, the cross looks like a beastly torture device, but Jesus viewed it as his throne. And on this throne, he exposed the subhuman nature of our evil by letting it do its worst, and then he overcame it with his divine life and love. Jesus' execution was his exaltation. So Jesus is the first human to overcome the beast, and as a result, he can partner with God to rule the world. And so now, Jesus is summoning a new humanity into existence, one that can overcome the beast in the same paradoxical way. To rule the beast by dying. And then by discovering that Jesus' life and power can become our life and power. So we can rule the world as God's partners, but Jesus style, in the power of service, humility, and self-giving love. If you do a study, uh, a biblical study on the Son of Man and how it's used, especially in the, in the Gospels, you'll see that there are three areas. There's actually three areas in which the Son of Man pertains to Jesus. The first is in his suffering. Uh, the Son of Man in Daniel and a couple other places, uh, I believe in Ezekiel also, uh, it says that the Son of Man has to suffer. And Jesus even taught his disciples that, hey, the Son of Man has to suffer, uh, but will be resurrected. And so there's this theme of the Son of Man 
uh, coming to suffer. The second one is enthronement. You saw in the video how the throne was supposed to be uh, human, you know, in domination or dominion over the earth as God's representative, but we vacated that throne with sin and, and disobedient. Well, this son of man is going to be enthroned, and you saw it in the vision that Daniel had in the book of Daniel, uh, that the son of man occupies this throne that's at the foot of God's throne, and, and that's what happens to the son of man. So you have the suffering, you have the enthronement, and then uh, one thing that the video did not uh, specify is the authority. If you read through Daniel and you read through the Gospels and, and when the Son of Man you know, pertains to Jesus and is referring to Jesus, then there is authority uh, because he is a representative of human and he came to make us back into the humans that God made in the beginning. And, and this son of man has that authority. Um, and so those are the three things that you really see in the book of, uh, in, in the books of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You see that the son of man has to suffer, that the son of man is enthroned, that, that is given a throne, and has authority uh, not only in heaven, but also in earth. And so that is the added dimension that we see as far as Jesus's identity. Yes, he is the son of God. Our chapter is entitled uh, Jesus, the son of God. But as you read through the chapter, there was also this son of man uh, title that was given to Jesus, and he actually refers to himself. So just know that that adds an extra dimension to Jesus's identity also. And by the way, if you were a first, uh, first century Jew during the time of Jesus, and you heard this prophet from Galilee doing miracles and, and teaching, and all of a sudden he called himself the son of man, all of a sudden, being a good Jew, you would know exactly what he's talking about. You would know about the book of Daniel, you would know about that vision. You would know about uh, a suffering and enthronement. Now, would it put all the pieces together for you? Probably not, because there was a lot of people back then, uh, a lot of Jews that believed, but they still did not completely understand. And the disciples are a good are a good uh, example in in someone believing, but not completely understanding. It's not until after the resurrection that they start getting a more full understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done. And so just uh, one of these days, it might be good for you to look up Son of Man, maybe in a Bible dictionary, or look online and do some reading about it and take a look at those scriptures. Uh, so that might be a nice little, little project for you. In summary, the, the first thing that we looked at was Jesus's growing power and his influence and how that helped us to see his true identity more clearly, specifically that he is the son of God, the Messiah, and that he was sent to suffer and die. And we'll learn in the next uh, week, uh, week or two uh, in, in place of our sins in, in our place on the cross. The second thing that we talked about or we we got exposed to this evening is Jesus's true identity uh, in being the son of man, that he uses the son of man to point to his suffering and to point to his enthronement and to point to his authority. Now, I come right back to this pointed question of what do you do with Jesus? What do you do with his identity? In our discussion, uh, uh, we pointed out uh, or we heard that there's all kinds of responses to Jesus and his identity as the, as the Messiah and what he has done, especially when we look next week at the cross. Uh, but the question to you and what we each have to grapple with, each person has to grapple with, is what do you do with Jesus? Do you believe that he is who he says he is? Or do you disbelieve? 
Or do you believe something else? Maybe he was just a smart person, a smart teacher. Maybe he was just a prophet. Um, but sooner or later, and before God, we all are going to have to stand before God and answer the question, what did you do with my son, Jesus? So that's something to ponder uh, this evening. And uh, let me encourage you to do your reading this week, which will be uh, pages 216 to 220. Pages 216 to 220 in your, in your study guide. And it is entitled, The Hour of Darkness. The Hour of Darkness. We're going to see how the story of Jesus' betrayal and his crucifixion helps us to have a clearer picture of his amazing gift to us. So next, this reading this next week is going to be a little tougher. Uh, we, we've seen Jesus start to build in popularity. I mean, he's, he's on a great track. He's, he's got, got crowds gathering to him. Uh, in the background, we see this hatred, and there's some people plotting to kill him. And this tension, part of the tension is going to be released next week, but the week after in his resurrection is when it uh, when that tension completely culminates uh, or is released, uh, but yes, the 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 story this next week is going to be about the hour of darkness, a lot of a lot of evil. Any questions or comments uh, about uh, your reading or anything that that has happened this week? Uh, any questions or comments? Right. Don't see any hands raised or anyone trying to talk on mute. All right. Well, if you'll uh, bear with me for just a second, live uh, students, let me say goodbye to our recording students. Thank you so much for uh, joining us, watching the videos, watching our short discussion. Let me encourage you uh, that if you don't have the study guide to go ahead and get it. Uh, if you need a study guide, you can call the office here at uh, Mount Calvary Baptist Church, and uh, we can help you with that. And uh, go through the study guide with us. It's not, it's not too late. I mean, it's not, not too late at all. And so we'll see you next time, and thank you so much.